uh, Untold with Havy Buzo. With me today is um, Ariel Cohen, um, who I've had on my previous show many times. He is a senior fellow at the Atlantic Council, and he's also the founding principal of the International Market Analysis. Thank you so much, Ariel, for joining me today. It's a pleasure. All right, we're going to start with a, a very important article that you uh, wrote recently at the Newsweek magazine, and you talked about the fact that there is a major failure in handling the pandemic by both Democrats and Republicans uh, because there was many signs and warnings that this might happen. Tell us a little bit more about this very important issue. Thank you. Um, and it's a pleasure uh, being on your show, um, as always. Um, I wrote this article because I remembered uh, after 9-11 that I looked at what happened. Uh, and uh, I came to the conclusion back then that uh, the fact that we were not prepared for that attack uh, was a result of what I call bureaucratic sclerosis, uh, meaning that the systems of the US government became so clogged, like a body of a person who has sclerosis that things don't circulate. If you remember, the information did not go up to President Obama, President Bush, and as we now know, President Clinton to uh, get rid of Osama bin Laden in time. Uh, I started looking at what happened now and a similar situation um, takes place, uh, which is, this is probably the fourth uh, epidemic uh, that uh, erupted uh, either from uh, China or from the Middle East. Uh, most of these diseases were coronaviruses, but not all of them. Uh, there was a SARS epidemic. You remember that? Uh, mm -hmm. Not too long ago, uh, that was a coronavirus. If I remember correctly, the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, MERS, that was also very deadly, was a coronavirus. Ebola, on the other hand, was not. Uh, and the swine flu that happened under President Obama was one of the HN viruses, H5N1, something like that. One of the respiratory viruses, but of a different type than um, the current coronavirus. So I looked at the response. And the response from the beginning of this century, from 2002, 2003, uh, under Bush was that, oh my God, we're going to be hit with an epidemic coming out from some country like China, and then it's going to spread around the world. So what do we need to do? We need to stop it in its tracks. The moment it comes out, we have to close everything down, and then we have to have preparedness. If it breaks out, if it's an outbreak, meaning that the containment didn't work, we need to be ready. So President Clinton, President Bush, uh, President Obama created and maintained and at some point expanded the National Strategic Reserve. What is a National Strategic Reserve? It's a government agency, not a very big one. They have 200 or 500 people working for them. For the federal government, it's not a lot of people. And they have storage of crucial, critical equipment. They have storage of masks. They have storage of the ventilators of the breathing machines and of other uh, things that we need uh, in an epidemic, including But drips. obviously they were not enough, right? That's what you've been talking obviously, about. In obviously, they did not estimate how many we would need if the virus is highly contagious, as were, repeat, the swine flu, the SARS, the MERS, and now the COVID. So a real failure. And what I'm asking myself, look, I'm from the former Soviet Union, you know that. Mm -hmm. In the Soviet Union, as a school child, they taught us in the 1970s. This is unfortunately a long time ago. This is like 45 years ago. They taught us that if, in case of a big war, we may be hit by nuclear, chemical, or biological weapons called weapons of mass destruction. You hear the word mass? Mm -hmm. They're mass. Many, many, many people. So having 
200 or even to 2,000 ventilators or 20,000 masks is not enough. Mm -hmm. You need to be able to cover enough people in the beginning so that you'll start manufacturing enough of this equipment in within a month and have plans to manufacture it. That did not happen. So in my article in Newsweek, you can Google it. And there mm -hmm. was another article later in the publication called The Hill. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm saying that number one, there's no such thing as a black swan. Black swan is an unanticipated event. There's no such as a thing as a black swan. There's a thing of the failure of intelligence and analysis and a failure of policymaking. So let's take a look at COVID and see, let's, let's see what happened. The well, Chinese- You also, and I do wanna talk about the fact that you pointed in your uh, article to the fact that there were uh, warning signs starting in 2007, there was a group of scientists in Hong Kong who uh, actually published an published. article talking about a biological Cor weapon. Coron coronavirus in A bats. coronavirus where it was in respiratory. Bats. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Yes. So, I mean, are you saying, Ariel, that this could be a biological warfare that we're experiencing uh, today? I'm, I'm not qualified to give this answer. I saw some publications. There were publications uh, in that direction, mostly in the popular media, not in the science media. The one publication in the Indian uh, science uh, journal was pulled back, pulled off, because apparently it wasn't rigorous enough. And then some scientists came out, maybe because they have a tendency to make bombastic and scandalous statements. And then other scientists came out and said, no, it's not true. It wasn't uh, biologically engineered. It wasn't engineered in the lab. But what do we know? In the city where the uh, virus originated, called Wuhan in China, there is the largest virology, virus studies institute in the world. We know for a fact that they went all around China, went into caves, captured these bats, took it into the lab. And we also know that uh, one of the facilities in China, uh, in Wuhan, was only several hundred meters from um, the wet market where the Chinese said this virus originated. We also know that when it came out for a long time, for weeks, the Chinese government suppressed this information. It mm -hmm. didn't acknowledge the scope of the pandemic. They didn't acknowledge that it transfers from person to person. Uh, and only later on, uh, they uh, acknowledged that. Uh, that was already too late. That was uh, January, uh, whereas the virus uh, burst out in December, and some people say even earlier than December. That's point number one. Point number two, the mm -hmm. Chinese doctors who warned about it were suppressed. They were called in by the police. They were told uh, to withdraw uh, their warnings, uh, et cetera. So there are big questions, not just about the um, uh, performance of the Trump administration, and before that of the Obama administration, with regards to the strategic supply uh, depot, that uh, when they had H5N1, the swine flu, they didn't replenish uh, the strategic supply. We are, have also very serious problems about uh, the Chinese behavior, about the behavior of the authorities in Wuhan, of the central authorities in Beijing. When did they know and what did they know? What did they when know? you when say Wuhan, know? you mean Wuhan, right? W Wuhan. Yes. Is, is Wuhan and the correct uh, pronunciation? <laughs> it, it's a transcription of the Chinese language. I'm okay. not a linguist uh, yes. of China. Yeah. So, yes, so, in, in Wuhan, yeah. yes. Some pronounce Wuhan, yes. Mm -hmm. So, uh, the questions are uh, why the World Health Organization, for example, did not warn us immediately that it transfers from person to person. The, di the difference was one week. So, one week they said it is not transferred. And then a week later, they probably dug some more and said it is transferred. But still, we're talking about January of this year. The U.S. intelligence was sending reports to Trump, to the White House, mm -hmm. saying, this is bad. This is highly contagious. And you heard the Trump administration saying, oh, don't worry about it. 
that will disappear. And Trump even say, said the word miraculously, miraculously disappear. How can you expect a virus that is killing hundreds, if not thousands of people in January and February uh, to disappear? So in our country, in the United States, the main switch, the main policy turn came on February 29th. This is two months too late. If they close, the, Trump says, oh, but I closed um, tra travel to China. Yes, you did. But for example, I flew from Israel to Istanbul to Washington on the 27th of February, mm -hmm. and my wife flew on the 7th of March, and Istanbul is a big, big hub, you know that. Yes, right? it's a hot with spot people, now for the... With people come, but the airport, Wuhan people virus. from Iran, mm -hmm. people come from Pakistan, people come from the Arab countries, from Africa, you name it, from China. Nobody did any tests, not in Istanbul, and not when we came to Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. So not just U.S., not just China, WHO and other countries were too doing too little too late, were too slow to respond. And now we have, what, 200 plus thousand people dead. We have tens of thousands of people dead but in this country. And uh, this Ariel. is not over yet. When we look at also the role of an organization uh, such as the World Health Organization, who also downplayed the danger of this virus, it also gave right. false information to the United States saying that this virus was not contagious from per one person to another. Um, so, I mean, those are also, and as you mentioned, this was not something that was expected um to that level of how highly contagious this virus is i mean this is we're talking about a situation that is unprecedented in the entire world i mean i don't know personally that i saw something uh similar where the whole world is shut down in this way um even if we make it no we didn't yes we didn't, we didn't. but so, but what do you think the you world health organization's role should have been um, and how, how did that actually hurt us and affected our response and how early we responded? Well, we didn't respond early enough. That's a fact. But if you look at what happened with the swine flu, with um, SARS, uh, and with uh, the bird flu, uh, with the uh, Middle East uh, Respiratory Syndrome, MERS, uh, they responded back then fast enough to prevent a pandemic. But are you comparing so, the viruses? Because this is a oh, much absolutely. more contagious. Yes. No, it's not. No. Uh, if you look at MERS, if you look at SARS, the first SARS, these are coronaviruses. They're highly contagious. They are uh, transmitted in a similar fashion. What, what is different is the speed of shutdown and probably also the assertiveness, the aggressiveness of WTO. And in any organization, including the Trump administration. What do you mean by WTO? Uh, the uh, WHO. The world, yeah, World, world Health Organization. Uh, world Health Organization. But, but let, I let mean, me, that's the whole world, Ariel. We're not talking only about the United States here. This is yeah, not yeah, something yeah. that the other viruses have caused. This is not only the United States that has been affected and impacted by this virus. We're talking about the entire world. I mean, look at Italy. Of course. Yeah. No, no, no. I'm, this virus is a pandemic, uh, meaning mm -hmm. the global epidemic. Yes. The previous viruses did not uh, expand. They, they did not kill so many people. They did not spread mm -hmm. so much. But what I'm trying to say is that in any organization, be it the US administration, be it uh, WHO, be it government of China, the organization is only as good as the people who work there. And people are different. If you look at who was handling the uh, epidemic back in 2002, 2003, and people who are handling it in 2007, 2009, uh, or now, these are different people. And these people now didn't perform as well. So organization is not a car that, you know, you had a car, even a car five years later or 10 years later can perform worse than when it's brand new. But now that people changed, that people were more relaxed, People were less responsible. And let's say one thing, WHO were listening to what the Chinese were telling them. And they were in a highly 
regulated environment. I don't want to use the word authoritarian. Oops, I just used it. Uh, but uh, and it is. They, I mean, we're not going to be hiding uh, behind our fingers here. It's the and, Communist uh, Party of China that's right. ruling. And and in order to uh, perform, in order to uh, function in a, a society like that, uh, WHO needed to show that is it paying attention, it's providing respect uh, to what the Chinese were saying, and the Chinese clearly were not saying enough. The World Health Organization bears a responsibility, and now we're having this kind of suspension of our funding to this organization because of that tremendous failure. I mean, that's a, this organization has failed the world, not only the United States, obviously the United States, it's its biggest funder. Um, and um, things need to change. I mean, after what everybody's going through right Absolutely. now. Absolutely. And what I'm advocating in my articles in Newsweek and in The Hill is that this is a situation where from my examination, you look, I, I'm a PhD and a lawyer. I worked in this field for over 30 years. In my opinion, it is not a partisan issue. It's not just Trump or just Obama. It's a, a systemic issue. And this is the time to create commissions of experts, not necessarily a partisan commission, uh, but we had um, an, um, a, a congressional commission up to 9-11 that examined 9 -1 -1. In my opinion, not enough because nobody was fired. Nobody was punished. There was no responsibility here when more than 10 times more people died than in 911 right we have yes. worldwide we have worldwide 300,000 people and there will be more in, mm -hmm. in 911 there were 3,100 people who died in america so people's lives matter uh, people the blood is not water people need to give responses and face responsibility i am not ready to talk about in what formats? Is it going to be a congressional commission? Is it going to be a judiciary committee of inquiry? We already saw the state of Missouri is suing the Chinese government, unprecedented, that a whole state of the United States with its reserves sues the communist leadership of China. But we need to come to a serious uh, investigation and people need to pay the price for their neglect. As a lawyer, I say at least it was a neglect, maybe criminal neglect, maybe more than that. Some people even throw around words like manslaughter. I'm not ready to go there. Manslaughter is criminal, but neglect and criminal neglect are very, very serious crimes. Mm -hmm. And you're talking about the CCP in this case, the Chinese Communist Party, that this is the uh, type of case like talking about Missouri suing well, China for I don't. I, well, China is not China's Communist Party. China is a state of China, yes. and states. But it's ruled have, by the Chinese Communist Party. Of course, and 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 states have what is called sovereign immunity. It's mm -hmm. very difficult to uh, sue and and collect because you're not only suing for the image and the uh, you know blame and shame. You also uh, are looking to compensate the victims. People died. Families became uh, without their providers. Uh, millions of people are out of work. So the material economic damage is horrible. We are in the worst economic recession since the Great Depression of the 1920s uh, and 1929 through 39, right? Mm -hmm. It can be very bad. I hope very much the economic recovery will start in the fall. But do I know it for sure? Do I have my crystal ball? No, I don't. Uh, so the economic damage is in trillions of dollars, trillions. So somebody needs to give an account for that. It's probably not going to be the party as a party, China as a state. And most probably, in my opinion, there will be trade deals. And maybe if China wants to take responsibility, if China rejects all the responsibility, we are going to the next level of confrontation between the West collectively and the United States and China. And China already started paying. China is already paying a very high price. Why? Tell me, what is China's paying today? And you are an expert China, on these issues. China is paying today hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars, because Great Britain refused to use Huawei 
technology for its 5G. And we have a problem because 5G is a technology that China was ahead. We did not, we do not have yet. The but China stole, basically. Years. Basically, China, they went ahead by, by taking that technology from the West and then trying to kind of go ahead and do it first and take they over. They did it first. The I, industry. I'm, I'm not an engineer. I'm not a mm-hmm. patent lawyer. I'm not prepared to say what did they steal and how much did they steal. What I'm saying Going. is that because of their behavior, China is already paying the price and they will lose more 5G Huawei uh, contracts in Europe, in the United States, and elsewhere. But it's the, it's the beginning, it's not the end. What will happen next is that the United States in a leadership position and other countries, European countries, Australia, New Zealand, and others will start pulling out their production facilities from China. Uh, Elon Musk probably was the last one uh, to uh, create a huge investment project uh, for the China Tesla factory. And more broadly, to my uh, great sorrow, because I was happy to see a globalizing world. world. It wasn't the first time the world, world was globalizing. More than 100 years ago, before World War I, the world was so globalized, you can have a person traveling uh, from Europe to India or to the Americas with no passport. To get off the uh, ship, uh, go around and then go back home, no border controls. Of course, we're living in a different world. Of course, now we will see much more control of your health status. So before the big concern was what? Terrorism, right? You got TSA, you got these x-ray machines for your luggage and for yourself. Now we'll have a thermometer, we'll have an instant virus check on you. And then, of course, there'll be something else, something new that will come that the uh, people who are supposed to prevent uh, these horrible catastrophes from happening, they will miss that because they always look in the back rear view mirror. They're not looking forward for the next danger. You talked about another very important point in your article about our bureaucracy, that we have a gigantic bureaucracy that basically failed. Um, and you talked about some examples of the FDA not working and being open and flexible enough to work with other private sector organizations or companies to come up with solutions. Tell me a little bit more about this. And I know you have well, to run soon. Yeah. Let's start with uh, another very important, very important government uh, organization called CDC, Center for Disease Control and Prevention. We just found out two days ago that CDC insisted on having a monopoly on testing initially, and FDA went with it. This we're talking February, okay? Mm -hmm. So instead of bringing Abbott Laboratories, Johnson & Johnson, and others, they said, no, 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 we are the government people. We know better. Do you know what they did? They have a life virus in the same lab as they were developing tests, and the life virus interfered with the test. So their testing was faulty. It failed. We didn't have tests until private sector companies uh, stepped in or nonprofits like University of Washington, that they were actively blocking in February from providing this test because they wanted to do everything in, in-house. But instead, they were polluting and contaminating their own tests. And this is so simple a school, a high school student who studies biology understands why you cannot have a live culture, live virus in the same lab that they're developing the test. Moreover, they could have, they could have, they didn't infect people with a live virus if their uh, test swabs were contaminated. Uh, And uh, now, two months later, so February, March, April, we still do not have enough tests. We do not have enough tests to test every, everybody. We don't have enough uh, antibody tests, which is absolutely crucial. Why? Because if you have an antibody test and you already, you um, or somebody else, uh, had a touch of this virus, 
develop by yourself the uh, immunity, right? And uh, you didn't have any symptoms, you can go back to work. You, you are not afraid of um, getting sick yourself or um, infecting other people. We don't have that. Yes, this is a new virus. Uh, it took years and years to develop uh, the test. Uh, it took some months, 11 months, I think, to develop a test for HIV. And then the treatment took 11 years, okay, for HIV. So hopefully this is a more, um, more simple situation. Uh, it's, it's a, it's a uh, more regular uh, virus. We saw other coronaviruses for years. So hopefully they will get uh, first the testing for the virus, then the testing for antibodies, and then treatment, and then vaccine. So at least four components these guys really need to focus on, and then hopefully, God willing, we will have the situation eh, more or less under control. Do we have time for one last question or you're out of, of time? Of course. There's not enough information about what's really happening in Russia. Right. Um, we know that the regime there um, and Putin probably, I mean, the health system is, you would know more. Uh, it's probably in very bad shape. We don't know the numbers of people infected with the COVID-19 at this point. Um, and how could that affect the regime itself? Uh, talking in the medium term because of the economical, uh, I mean, also disaster that is accompanying uh, the pandemic. Well, as in many other countries, with some leaders, like the leader of Belarus, um, Alexander Lukashenko, who said, oh, nothing to worry about, or this is just a regular cold, all, all kind of uh, uninformed statements like that. So initially, Putin would say, oh, this is just rumor mongering by the Western intelligence. Why did he say that? He's listening to his own security people. He's not listening to anybody else. He only listens to his intelligence people. And his intelligence people, excuse me, are not medical doctors. They're not epidemiologists and virologists. They had no idea what they're talking about. They misinformed their leader. Uh, and uh, only in March, the Russians started worrying about it, especially a lot of Russians um, were traveling in Europe and Italy and other places. So they closed the border with China in January. They didn't close the border in Europe in February and March. So more of the elite people start coming back to Moscow and then it spread. And now they're saying they have several thousands of cases and only 300 plus deaths. With all due respect, I do not believe it. The epicenters are in Moscow, it's about 13,000 and in St. Petersburg about 6,000 and then hundreds in other regions. In reality, what they do, they have a case and they report it as uh, pneumonia, double-sided pneumonia, but not as COVID. Um, they were saying the same thing about Syria. They're saying everybody now has pneumonia. There's a very high number or, you know, the high rate of pneumonia because they're not, just not acknowledging the fact that it's um, the COVID-19. Right. Uh, the of Wuhan course, virus. Russia, yes. Russia having um, a very strong police state component they immediately started come up, coming up with everybody needing to get a QR cord, uh, code, you know, the, the QR code. You download it on your computer, mm -hmm. on your smartphone, and uh, you register for every trip you have to register. You go to a store, you go to, um, uh, for a walk, you go to work, you, you, you have to register. But there were a lot of screw-ups. Moscow is a huge city of 12 million people with a very strong, big metro system. They decided that they keep the metro system open. The metro system in New York and London and Moscow is the place to get the computer, uh, to get the uh, virus. So there were huge queues, people trying to get into the metro, showing their QR code, showing their smartphone. And what else? They really screwed the old people because old people in Russia do not have smartphones. They either have a little brick phone, a cell phone, or don't have cell phones at all. So the old people couldn't go anywhere at all, couldn't even go buy themselves food. And finally, uh, because it's a top-down state, it's a, what they call the vertical state, mm -hmm. uh, people in the lower level uh, of government are afraid to report the truth up the line. So 
there is a competition to report fewer cases around the regions of Russia. So the situation is still uh, pretty bad and going worse. They're not flattening the curve. Uh, they're cheating on the statistics. And Putin, like Trump, said, oh, let the governors deal with that. I'm not giving every governor specific orders. It makes sense. It's a very big country. It's 11 time zones. And there are 89 regions or more regions in Russia than states in the United States. But if it fails, the governors will be to blame. If it succeeds, Putin will take credit. <laughs> As always, isn't it? Um, thank you so Thanks. much, Ariel. It's always great to hear your insights on all of this. Um, I definitely would love to have you again on soon. Um, that was it for today with The Untold with Heidi Buzo. I would love to hear your thoughts about our episodes and uh, please like and share and subscribe and see you next time. Bye.